How are wars in Israel and Ukraine related? How is the latter impacted by the former? Let's analyze. So the Ukraine war had dominated the global turn of events and analyses ever since Russia launched a special military operation against its neighbor in February 2022. And no matter how delayed and calibrated, the military assistance by the United States alone has been the critical driver behind Ukraine's resistance against a far bigger and a more formidable adversary, that is Russia. However, Hamas's brutal attack on Israel on 7th October compounded several factors at once and turned the world's attention away from Ukraine. So from the perspective of the ongoing war in Europe, the West Asian crisis has indeed created a diversion in US military aid. But the point to remember is that the nature of Washington's aid to Kyiv and Jerusalem requires closer scrutiny to understand how much of it actually overlaps. But that's not all. Hamas's attack has also created adversity for Russia, which has had a close relationship with Israel. If you remember, in the early months of the Ukraine war, Israel had refused to send weapons to Ukraine because it did not want its relationship with Russia affected and its Middle East calculus upended. Instead, it projected itself as a mediator between the two. I have written about that. Take a look at that article. But coming back to the present complications, Hamas-Israel situation has further bewildered the calculus of an economically distressed and a rather war-fatigued Europe that was gearing up to not only send humanitarian aid as it has been sending, but also militarily support Ukraine as the war is set to enter its second winter. You know, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky, with his penchant for adept diplomacy, seems to have read into this mounting pressure on his allies, especially on the US. So he did a smart thing. Rather than publicly expressing his apprehensions about impending competition from Jerusalem over, say, ammunition aid, he has pitched Ukraine more as a sympathetic ally to Israel and the West. On the other hand, Zelensky has also been realistic all this while. He made a quick trip to NATO headquarters in Brussels to secure an additional $2 billion in aid for Ukraine as sirens rang through the skies and rubble mounted on the streets in southern Israel. So what does the situation tell us about the most fundamental lesson of international politics? That friends and foes change as national interests shift. There is little doubt that an intensifying war in the West Asian region, also called the Middle East, especially if Israel chooses to proceed with the ground offensive in Gaza, will impact the US's ability to support Ukraine both militarily and economically. And the probabilities of a ground offensive in Gaza are rising by the day. And like I said, it will also affect Russia's equation with Israel. And the tide seems to be turning already. How? President Putin made an emphatic statement that Israel-Hamas war, and I quote, is a clear example of the failure of US politics in the Middle East, unquote. But with that statement, he did not offer any condolences for the Israelis, especially the children and women tortured and killed in the attack. Meanwhile, Russia's handshake with China got firmer in the past few days. The whole world noticed that President Putin who skipped the recently concluded uh, BRICS and G20 summits in Johannesburg and New Delhi respectively, received a red carpet welcome in Beijing at the Belt and Road Initiative, the BRI Forum. Now to connect those dots with the situation in Middle East, the long-standing war in Ukraine, besides unprecedentedly drawing Russia and China closer, has started deep cooperation between Russia and Iran especially when it comes to the supply of Iranian Shahid drones that Moscow has used extensively against Ukraine. Therefore, Iran today has become far more important to Russia than Israel. And if Iran and Lebanon's militant organization known as Hezbollah 
are in fact supporting Hamas as the Western intelligence says, the West Asian war will evolve to be a very uncomfortable situation that could upend Russia's West Asia strategy in many ways and this will need further analysis. But for now, what about the more direct impact on the war in Ukraine? So in terms of a more direct impact of the West Asian situation on Ukraine, a closer scrutiny of US military aid and its mechanisms is required. So the US already sends about $3 billion in annual military aid to Israel, making it the largest recipient of American aid since World War II. Sending extra aid under present circumstances will definitely test the capabilities of the already strained arms manufacturing supply chains that have been so far focused only on Ukraine. There is uh, still no clarity on whether major arms manufacturers in the US are expanding the production facilities. Um, for instance, last year they wanted guarantees from the US government and one can't really be sure if this issue has been resolved totally. But a more logical question to ask is, do Israel and Ukraine need similar military aid? Perhaps not. The military assistance that US is sending to Israel in the aftermath of the Hamas attack is quite different from the kind it supplies to Ukraine. The former uh, that means to Israel, includes precision-guided munitions called the PGMs that are fired from uh, fighter planes such as F-35s, F-16s and attack helicopters such as Apaches. The requirement of PGMs is likely to go up if Israel starts a ground offensive in Gaza. So that is the first type of military aid. The second is that Jerusalem may also need greater volumes of aid for interceptor replenishments for its Iron Dome system. And only a few days after the Hamas attack, the US moved the USS Gerald R. Ford Carrier Strike Group, its most advanced aircraft carrier, to the eastern Mediterranean alongside warships. It also sent the USS Normandy, which is basically a guided missile cruiser with guns and an assortment of destroyers like the Thomas Hutner and Roosevelt. And it is noteworthy that the Pentagon has already positioned a stockpile of ammunition worth at least $2 billion at at least six sites across Israel for emergency deployment. That is what the US is doing for Israel. On the other hand, none of such military assistance goes to Ukraine. Now, Kyiv is actually looking for ways to bolster its attack on Crimea and fight a painful battle of attrition along the front line. And that is where the recently acquired 2 billion aid package that Zelensky secured at NATO may help. This aid assurance has come after the arrival of the long-awaited Army Tactical Missile Systems or the ATACMS, both cluster and long-range type, something multiple US sources, including National Security Council spokesperson Adrian Watson, has confirmed. The confirmation came after Ukraine's deadly attack on Russia's Berdyansk and Luhansk airfields in eastern Ukraine on 17th October, so that's pretty latest. Attackims are basically fired from HIMARS launchers that are already supplied to Ukraine. Attackims and HIMARS complement the storm shadow missiles given by the UK, which have been crucial in Ukraine's increasing attacks on Russia's Black Sea Fleet in at least the last two months. So where do Israel and Ukraine really compete? It's basically in two areas. The West Asia crisis may not immediately impact US aid to Israel and Ukraine, but a larger competitive situation over ammunition aid can't be ruled out. The first area of competition, therefore, will be over the 155mm artillery shells that both Kyiv and Jerusalem have been heavily relying on. The US will have to dig deep into its munitions stockpiles around the world for its dual aid to remain steadily afloat. The second likely point of competition might be over the US's internal mechanism of providing military aid, known as the Drawdown Authority. Now, what is this? In support of the aid to Ukraine, Congress has progressively increased its cap on the Drawdown Authority from $100 million to $11 billion in 2022, most recently in the additional Ukraine Supplemental Appropriations Act of 2022. 
Since then, the Joe Biden administration has deployed the Presidential Drawdown Authority, take a guess, 44 times to provide military assistance to Kyiv. Now, with the war in Israel, the Biden administration is weighing the use of some part of this drawdown authority to send weapons to Israel. Therefore, the world seems set to see more movement of drawdown authority, a reiteration of just how intersectional the crises of our times have become. But there is mess in the US as well. These fluctuations come at a time when the House and Senate are undergoing extraordinary political instability, which increased after the ouster of Representative Kevin McCarthy as House Speaker earlier this month. Without a Speaker, the House cannot really pass legislation that raises apprehensions about when that aid will really begin to flow, even if drawdown authority is tapped for Israel. If Defence Secretary Lloyd Austin's recent statements in Brussels accurately tell us about the thinking in DC, the Biden administration is pursuing to complementarily support both Ukraine and Israel. The key word here is complementarity, which means aid to both is not mutually exclusive, but actually complements US policies. Despite such assurances, the fact that the weapons being currently sent to Ukraine and Israel differ, the strain on US abilities is imminent. In my opinion, Washington needs to devise separate and clear strategies for Eastern Europe and the Middle East and also prepare for a likely war in the Straits, that means Taiwan. So this triangle of US security assistance in three dimensions which is spread across diverse geographies and entwined contexts remains a complex proposition to actualize. The most critical determinant, however, for US support to Ukraine will be the election in November 2024. It is likely that America's attention to Ukraine may taper down regardless of who comes to power because the public opinion for more military support to Ukraine has been declining. Brussels, the other pillar of support to Ukraine, knows this and has therefore been paying heat to play a more tangible role in arming Ukraine and putting together a more sustainable security architecture for itself. And it is doing so despite all the hurdles, mainly its vulnerable critical infrastructure as shown by attacks on the Nord Stream 2 last year and the recent attack on the Baltic connector gas pipeline where a case is being filed against a Chinese vessel right now. So, to conclude, the dynamics of multiple wars across disparate and yet interconnected fronts is quite befuddling. A deeper question that strategist and writer Mick Ryan recently addressed was about the inevitability of the element of surprise or the unpredictable in war. The takeaway is, despite all strategizing, there is little one can preempt uh, to factor in the disruptions in the bizarre workings of human ability to cause, rebel, and counter means and forms of destruction. The role of analysis, therefore, is to help understand this complexity a little better to devise strategies as per our own national interests. It's the classic quest of finding some method to this madness. I will be back to analyze this and more as the world is entering indeed a more dangerous phase and we need to actively hedge our bets, prioritizing our interests. Stay tuned.